Welcome to our chat about leading through turbulent times. I'm here with Jeff Emmelt, former CEO and chairman of GE. Really excited to have this chat and, and excited to be in Atlanta. It's great, it's great to be back in Atlanta. So I've met so many old friends uh, here today and Vanessa is a Georgia Tech grad, so. Yeah, it's great Almost to be like here. home. So, leading through financial crisis, I'm excited to dig into this with you because you led GE through some very interesting times. Um, and now you sit on several boards, from Series A companies like Orchestro all the way to post-IPO companies like Twilio and Desktop Metal. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing everything across the board and hopefully applying some of the things you've, <laughs> you've experienced in the past to, to these startups. So, um, Jeff, are we in a time of crisis? Uh, no. I, again, I, I think, um, you know, being around in 2008 and 2009 or some of the other uh, really volatile things I've seen, you know, like when you were afraid to get up in the morning to t read the Wall Street Journal or, or turn on CNBC, that's a crisis. This is a cycle. This is a, a classic uh, cycle. I think what makes it feel uh, like a crisis, you know, Vanessa, is the fact that we've had a whole generation of business people that haven't seen inflation, that haven't seen interest rates go up. So it feels maybe a little bit more stark uh, than, than it really is. If this had happened in like 1997, you'd say, ah, just another, just another cycle, <laughs> right? So I think one aspect is just to get people calm and uh, figure out ways to get through this in the best way possible. Well, I'm excited to, to talk to you about what you've learned um, while leading one of the biggest companies on the planet. Um, I think you, you win the award for uh, craziest first week in a gig that I've ever heard. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your first week as CEO at GE? Yeah, so I, I became a CEO on September 7th of 2001. And uh, September 11th happened like three days later. And, uh, you know, the world just kind of changed. You know, if we were in the insurance business, so we insured the World Trade Center. Or, uh, the World Trade Center. Uh, we owned 1,200 aircraft, we owned NBC, we had financial services, so basically the crisis was all around us. Um, I, I, think, I think through that and other things that, you know, I've gone through, Vanessa, it's, uh, there's some attributes that are the same as you go through these uh, crises and cycles. Uh, the first one is a leader has to absorb fear. You know, you, you can't be uh, a generator of fear, you have to kind of give uh, steady guidance. You have to stay focused on, on uh, what's going on. It's like driving a car through a rainstorm. You turn down the radio, right? You turn on the lights. You do the same thing, I think, whether it's a small company or a big company. Uh, you have to be very deliberate in your steps, right? You, you don't want to panic. You don't want to take missteps. You have to take uh, one step after another. You, you have to, in an organization, find the problem solvers. Not everybody's a problem solver. In, in fact, very few people are really a problem solver. You have to seek them out. But maybe the most important thing you have to do in a crisis is hold two truths at the same time. One is that things can always get worse. Right? Doesn't matter how bad they are today, they can always get worse. Trust me, I, I've been there. <laughs> but the other one is, is there's going to be a future, right? So if you go back to that moment in time, you, you know, Vanessa, between, let's say, September 11th and October 1st of 2001, we loaned about $20 billion to airlines to help them uh, from going bankrupt, right? We took the long view. These are our customers. We didn't know what was going to happen. We made an incredible amount of money on, <laughs> on, on, on the things uh, that we did. If you talk to KKR or Blackstone, they acquired all the aviation supply chain right after 9-11, right? Private equity went out there and acquired all of them. So if you can invest in a good business at a really dark time, that's when investors really have a chance to make super normal returns. And so that's, you know, that's how you make it through a crisis. Some yeah. defense, some offense. What about priorities? Do priorities shift in time of crisis? Or what should, what are like the top priorities? When yeah, I think, it, again, now I'll put my small company investor hat on. A time like crisis, get cash, get it now. Like, don't worry about where your stock price goes. Don't worry about where your valuation goes. Get cash, right? Give yourself a chance to play another day. And that's where I see people, 
you, you tend to focus on the wrong things and you get swallowed up by events, but you have to keep that as a number one priority. I, I think the second one is, Vanessa, is like keep focused on what, what it is you want your company to do in the first place. Like if you're running a small company and you're having margin issues and you cut R&D, you're just gonna keep cycling down the same path, right? So, so make those kind of trade-offs. And the last thing is try to find ways to look for opportunity, right? Because there's always gonna be uh, other people that are out there that aren't gonna take the same long-term view that you're gonna take. And, and I think that's the kind of priorities. Cash, solve the right problem, stay focused on the long-term, you know, you get through things. Yeah. So another period of your leadership that I find really interesting is the earthquake in Japan uh, in 2011 and the nuclear meltdown that ensued. Tell us, that, tell us about that day because I have so many questions. So you've got like, this is a real hit parade. Here. I, I'm going like through everything. like all the worst times in, in your <laughs> life, just like in order. No, but it, it, this is kind of an interesting perspective. You know, we were, uh, we made the reactors in... Um, the nuclear reactors. The nuclear reactors that were in Fukushima. It was just this horrible disaster. And you never know when crisis is going to come uh, your way. So you, you just have to maintain a sense of calm as it comes. And I'd been on a global trip. I was actually in Australia at the time. And, uh, you know, this was really scary because there was nobody that could get to the plant there was a, like a helicopter that was like sending images, but you couldn't see what was going on. So it's like 4 a.m. in Australia. I'm doing this crisis phone call. There's a CNN scroll saying, you know, Fukushima disaster, worst ever, uh, all GE reactors. <laughs> Going to have to shut down Tokyo and Los Angeles. You know, and Food my, supplies potentially my, contaminated. My general, general counsel is freaking out and saying, oh, we got to do all this stuff. And I end that meeting and I have to go down and... Uh, do an all-employee meeting with a thousand employees who had nothing to do with the nuclear business, right? So I, I sometimes, you know, I, I teach a class, a business school class, and my students all say, you know, we get taught about transparency, good leaders have to be transparent, you got to be transparent all the time. So if I was transparent at that moment in time, I would have walked in that room with a thousand people and said, we are screwed. <laughs> Just, <you better. laughs> Catch the next plane. Join a different company, whatever it takes, right? <laughs> you know, just go, you know? But that's how you do, right? You say, hey, you know, we got this little thing going on in Japan. Don't worry. Our best people are working on it. But let's talk about your business. Let's talk about where we are here. And, and I think as you're going through crisis, or if you're in a small company now and you're worried, you know, give your team things that they can work on. Don't, don't lean over backwards to scare them. Give them problems they can solve. Put Put, the, put the, the, the cycle in terms they can understand. And I think that's how you keep teams together during, uh, during the, the worst times. Yeah. Um, you had to make a lot of decisions uh, in these times of crises, right? We, we talked about, like, how do you kept GE afloat after, yeah. after 2011, or the 9-11 situation, also in Fukushima. Like, lots of decisions you know, get made in a short amount of time that could potentially impact the entire trajectory of your business. A lot of the leaders here are making decisions with very imperfect data or little data. But it just feels like in time of crisis, it adds a whole yeah, new for layer. Sure. For sure. I think the first thing is, I, I think whether you run a big company or a small company, it helps have a point of view. You, you know, in other words, things that kind of shape, when you don't have perfect data, you need things that kind of, kind of shape your perspective, uh, you know, at, during those times. You need to make decisions on how much data you need to have before you make the decision because you can't ever have perfect data. Some leaders like to make decisions with two or three people. Some, some leaders like to make decisions in big rooms with lots of people around. I, I favored big rooms because I wanted to get as many different uh, voices as you can. Um, you know, knowing what to do when you make a decision is actually quite easy. It's actually super easy. Like, knowing when to do it is the hard part, right? So, so get, getting your own sense of time and then ask for help. You know, I, I, uh, I ask for help, but man, decisions come at you fast and furiously. And we, we talk about crisis versus cycle. So after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, that actually wasn't the worst day. The worst day was when Washington Mutual uh, was sold to J.P. Morgan. All the bondholders got wiped out and the Goldman Sachs uh, bankers came to Fairfield where I was working Friday evening and said, you guys got to go out and raise 
15 or 20 billion dollars next week, right? This is to support GE Capital. Now, some of you guys, that seems like a big number. It is a big number, but just the problems are the same. It's just more zeros that I had to deal with, right? <laughs> and I had like, a, so it took them a while for them to convince me. I called a board meeting Saturday morning, and this was before Zoom. So it was just like a, a telephone post in the middle of the conference room. My CFO, <laughs> my general counsel, and me, you know, 12 or 15 board members on the call. You know, hey guys, kind of rough out there. Um, we're going to go raise $15 billion next week. You know, <laughs> just dead silence on the other line. <laughs> Is that okay with you? You know, you guys, and, and dead silence, right? It was just too much to bear, but, it, you know, things were moving so quickly, you had to kind of have that kind of interaction. And Roger Penske, who a lot of you may know because you're race car drivers and things like that, he was a really great board member. And he shouts out over the phone, hey guys, good thinking, let's go get the money. It's the right thing to do, good luck, let's go do it. And then like 12 other people say, yeah, let's go get the money, let's go get the money, right? But you need advice, you need people with you to give you, you know, the right kinds of input at the right time. And, and uh, that's the way crisis work, right? You got to make the decision. We made the decision, we got the money. And at that moment in time, we were kind of safe for whatever was going to happen in but the just, financial crisis. You skipped through that. You, you got the money, right? Like trying to fundraise when banks are all going under and... Yeah, it was, it was really... So like when I, when I... Here's the line I always use with founders when they're really in trouble, which I have a bunch of them now. I say, you know what, Rick or whomever, this is only the 17th worst thing I've ever seen. You know, <laughs> just, just to try to break the ice a little bit. You're like, I've seen 32 things just like that, right? Yeah. And so it's just, it's conveying that you can work through these problems in a constructive way uh, as time goes. In this case, we actually had uh, Buffett loan us $3 billion. That really underwrote the whole transaction and uh, it took us uh, six hours. I'm sorry, six hours to yeah. raise. But, but you had to get Buffett. Like, Buffett was the catalyst That was a key. And uh, David Solomon, who's a good friend of mine, he's the CEO of Goldman Sachs now, he was kind of leading the equity raise. So he and I, we were set up in my office together with my CFO. And, yeah. Was it hard? And it was roundly, like, it was probably the single best under-pressure decision I'd made in a 40-year business career. And it just got crushed, right, externally for it, right, uh, in terms of, having to go out and raise money and things like that. But that's, you know, I think if you're gonna, if you're gonna start a company, which I hope there's lots of entrepreneurs out here, lots of good investors, you just have to be willing to get criticized, right? And, and the decisions that you make, and you have to develop, you know, I, I would say nobody really has thick skin. You just choose to take the high road. You, you, have, to, you have to find ways to kind of get input and keep going even when you're being criticized. And those were the kinds of times uh, like we were living in then, right? So it's, it's um, you know, there's companies out there right now whose stock is probably down 30% this year, and the CEO is having probably the best year they've ever had in terms of the quality of decisions they're making, the, the steps they're taking for their future. And it's just, you just have to be contextual. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Um, speaking of access to capital, um, how do you think of it in general? Like today it seems bumpy. We have entrepreneurs saying it's really hard to fundraise. It's one of the hardest fundraises I've ever had, even though my business is doing great, right? Um, others that are saying, I just raised 150 million from XYZ uh, over a text thread. Um, how do we hold these, these things? And it's, a great, it's a great question, because there's money out there for sure, right? Even though, Stock market's down, you know, interest rates are up, right? There, there's lots of financial pressures around the system. But there's still quite a bit of, of uh, dry powder that funds have, uh, quite a bit of capital that's out there to be invested. And I, I think right now, you know, if you're on the investor side, the tendency, Vanessa, as you know, is to take care of your own portfolio first, right? So you go through the decision of how much money Am I going to have to put in my existing companies versus how much new money is out there to be had? And, and there's that element. And then there's other elements that say this is the best time to be doing new investments because I'm going to get a more economical uh, perspective, right? So, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're running a fund, if you're an investor, 
you've got to keep looking for good investments because ultimately that's how you get paid, right? Yeah. Ultimately that's, you, you, you can't sit on your hands forever. I, I think if I was a founder raising money right now, I would put more of an emphasis on raising more at a lower valuation than raising less at a higher valuation. In the sands of time, you can make all this up. But I, I see people being really silly about making short-term decisions around having to have, you know, not taking a down round or something like that, which I just think is, is uh, kind of silly. And the last thing I'd say is, look, I, I spent 36 years as an operator, five years as an investor. I, I, uh, love, no I love investors. Taken. No offense um, taken. You know, operators just are more sanguine during cycles because you always feel like you can figure stuff out over time. Investors tend to get more excited as these cycles go through, right? So, you know, I'll sit in a board meeting where most of the board are venture capitalists or investors. We'll talk things through. And then I'll say to the founder, here, come on, let's take a walk. <laughs> Don't listen to that stuff, okay? <laughs> just uh, just, uh, just keep, keep going down this I'm path. I'm so glad we're on a board together. Keep going down, this, so path. Keep going down this path because they're going to get you in trouble. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be another day. So, you, you know, together we make, we, make, uh, we make it work, right? But you just, you, just you, you know, like cycles are such a part of business. They're such a constructive part of business that you know, it's not a terrible thing to be going through kind of what we're going through right now. But companies will get wiped out. For sure. Yeah. But you know, I would say, Vanessa, like, um, money was so easy for so long, there's probably too many companies, right? There, there's probably too many things doing the same thing. Yeah. Too many companies doing the same thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That's all part of the creative, it's all part of the company building process, so there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But I, I think a little consolidation and a little bit of, of uh, creative destruction is not a bad thing. And this is it's probably going to happen in yeah. this cycle. You know, it's just, I, I would tell my friends when I went out to venture, I, you know, most people that live my life either go into private equity or, um, or venture. And I had started my career selling plastic at GE. So I, I dealt with small entrepreneurs who ran molding shops and things like that. And I learned so much from them as a very early uh, uh, in my career that that's what I wanted to do was work with, uh, with, with kind of founders and entrepreneurs. And, and um, you know, I, I just think that the company building process is more important. And that's kind of what we're going to go through right now, right? We're yeah. just going to have to take it step by step and, and uh, uh, try to understand that during cycles is when some of the biggest opportunities exist. I agree with that, but can we unpack that just a little bit? Like sure. why? Why is it during these downturns? We, we hear about that all the time. Like this is the best time to start a business and I talk to founders like this sucks. Like I'm trying to fundraise. It's not well, a great time to No, good times, <laughs> good times are better than bad times for sure. Okay, okay. so let's be clear. Let's okay, because everyone's like hyping this up. Okay. Let's be clear on that. I, I, I think the difference is like, you know, if you were doing an, uh, a company that did like APIs for uh, uh, CRM systems or, or enterprise software systems and a valuation is 75 times revenue, you just sit there and say, that just doesn't make sense. You know, I, 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 it's a really good, com you know, you, you go through the time period like we had the last three years, really good companies were uninvestable because the economic dynamics just didn't make any sense. Yep. So that to me is the positive benefit of uh, getting, you know, down to a more, I would say, realistic, returnable investment level, number yeah. one. Number two, look, um, you know, you guys see, you watch CNBC every day and let's say a company has a bad number, the stock goes down 10% and the sell side analyst downgrades the stock and you say, okay, <laughs> thanks, you know? <laughs> so I think s there's so much knee-jerk reaction that goes on during cycles that you just get good deals because there's a lot of bad investors out there yeah. and they give you the chance to kind of pile in. So I, I don't say it, I, I, I don't say it as a, uh, as you need bad cycles to get 
better. I, I say it more that you, you really make good investment decisions when the risk reward is out of balance. Yeah. And the risk reward tends to be out of balance in bad days more than good ones. Yeah. That's what we're seeing, I think. Yeah. Um, but I am seeing a lot of fear. So a lot of investors are paralyzed by this fear and not deploying capital. Um, and I see some you know, leaders also being a little paralyzed by this fear and like, I'm just going to fundraise when it gets better, it's bound to get better. And so you have some people that are kind of you know, sitting it out. Does that last? Do they, how does this Yeah, I don't out? think so. Again, I, I think the dynamics, if you're running private investment, is if you raise money, it probably needs to be redeploy redeployed in a reasonable time period. So you're going to have more people leaning in to do good deals uh, over time, right? Yeah. And we'll see how the next couple months go, but that's my expectation. Um, I, I think that the presentations, or you know, if I were running a small company looking to raise funds, you know, my, my pitch would basically be um, the essence of what I do, right? So, so here's how it still fits, even in this environment. But if I raise money now, um, we can last four years, and at that time, we're going to have a liquidity event, right? Yeah. So what, what your investment right now will allow you and me to do together is eliminate a C round or, or eliminate another investment step. So I would put on a hat that's investor friendly mm -hmm. as ways to approach um, where the investors are right now. And that's kind of what I, what I look for. In, uh, I, when basically I sit down and evaluate any of these companies, it's kind of like size of the idea. Fundamentally, what does the, what does the business, is it a high margin, high investment, low investment, high margin, you know, those kinds of things. I look at the ecosystem of who's the competitors, who are the customers, how good's the team, and then who a buyer could be, mm. right? So every time I sit down to look through a pitch like this, I kind of mentally go through, you know, okay, this is a small idea, but it's a small check. It's got the chance to be an 80% gross margin business with low capex. Uh, the competitors all stink, <laughs> right? It's solving a problem for the customer, but the competitors stink. This is a third time founder, highly bankable, and Workday could buy them, right? Okay, yeah. I'll invest. Sounds pretty good, <laughs> let's go. So that's kind of what I, what I go through. And then, you know, in a crisis when you're trying to raise the next round, you have to be able to pitch back to an investor like me how one of those five things gets better and how your approach that's key. is working, right? How one that, of those things key. gets better. Yeah. Um, and then communicating with your team, right? How do you, like your, your teams probably in this time are, am I at the right place? Should I go somewhere big and safe? Should I drop out of the workforce? It's a great question, particularly right now, you know, Vanessa, because yeah. it's just been such a fragile uh, workforce, particularly in uh, Silicon Valley, but really everywhere, you know, with, um, you know, kind of the high turnover, high churn, great resignation, quiet quitting, and all that stuff. So I, I think you're always trying to, in a crisis, trying to strike the right balance between being really transparent and, and not promotional, you know, in other words, truthful. But at the same time, you have to say to people, here's where we're going next. Here's where we're going next. Okay, we just, I, I know it was hard, we just had to lay off 80 people it's 20% of our workforce, I hate to do it, it's incredibly hard, but you know, in two years, here's where we're gonna be. This is the company we're building, here's what you're signing up to do. And so I, I find that founders, you know, kind of like whiff on the day two story. Yeah, You know, and, and again, they, they, they spend a lot of time on the day one story, but don't spend enough time on, okay, here's where we're going next. And that's why, that's why people stay. You know, I, I just think, um, you know, when I join small private boards or even small public boards, I always would say to people, look, I'll join the board, um, but whatever you do, don't put me on the audit committee, whatever you do. It's no fun, I'm not good at it, you know, blah, blah, <laughs> put me on the comp committee. Being on the comp committee really stinks these days, right? More stock options, what's working, yeah. you know, things like that. So I think for all of you who are founders, really understanding w how people work and why they work, right? I, I just found that by and large, the people I was working with, they really didn't know how work got done. 
they didn't have a strong enough connection with the people that did the work with them and for them. And as a result, we were always chasing the symptom and not the cause. And I just think, um, you know, I ran a super big company, more than 300,000 people. I didn't do every job, but I knew how basically every job inside the company got done. And, and I always spent a fair amount of time trying to see it through their eyes. And I just think that, you know, Vanessa, there's just not a, there's just not a connection, a strong enough connection between the leadership teams and the people doing the work. And that's how this stuff gets out of control. I could not agree more. Yeah. And I, I see a lot more of that discipline of leaders of more traditional companies yeah. um, and a lot less of it at startups. See how you get treated? It's like, you know, <laughs> you sit around an investment meeting and then people say, well, like, this company would be so great, except they have to sell to those big company jerks all the time. <laughs> They're so stuck on their ways. So, you're hurting my feelings. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, you know, um, board members, we're both on boards. Yeah. Uh, we apparently have very different views of that. But um, what is the role of a board member in times of crisis? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I, I think for all of us, for the founders or, or people running uh, companies, you need to see your board on the worst day possible. You know, in other words, don't, don't think about it like when things are good and you're making your numbers and you're raising money. Think about your board on the absolute worst day you can imagine because quite honestly, when things are good, you don't really need your board that much, right? But when things are bad, you need them a lot. And I think you need to be able to go around the room and kind of see who's really committed to the company, what kind of skill set they bring. And in a time of crisis, you have some very specific swim lanes that people have to stay in. Uh, one is funding, where investors can be immensely helpful. On uh, If cash is what you need, uh, funding is really important. Uh, if, if you're uh, operationally running out of cash, you're going you're gonna to need a different set of hands in that. And so I would say a lot of the boards that I'm on don't have the right skill sets around the table to kind of make it through the kinds of uh, environments uh, that we're in. And I, I never really, you know, kind of, I always view my role, particularly with startups, is, is as a helper. You know, I, because I ran a conglomerate and I've done business for a long time, you know, I can walk into a, a room and say, okay, this leader needs, she needs uh, somebody that can help herself. This leader needs uh, somebody that can uh, hire a finance person for them. Right, so I think for more experienced people like me, it's finding the right niche yeah. uh, and where it goes. But you know, I probably talk to three CEOs every day, yeah, every day, because they're going through a really tough time, and you know, it's just such a lonely job, particularly in a crisis. You're getting criticized by everybody, and it's helpful to just have somebody that they can talk to. Yeah, you. Um, I loved when you, you bucketed board members in three categories. I tried not to take offense, but uh, why don't you share those those three buckets? And no, I just think it's it's true for public companies as well, which is there's always people that just wander onto boards. They're they're perfectly fine people, but they just didn't have enough to do, want a little <laughs> extra money, you know, and and they're okay, and they're on every. By the way, I'm describing every board that's ever existed, not just. And then there's people that are like really expert, but pretty narrow. You know, in, in other words, they're, they're very expert at investing or mm -hmm. fundraising, but not broad in terms of operational and things like that. And then there's people that are, you know, that are, uh, have seen it before, have done it before, maybe not as good at investing or things like that. And I tell the founders, look, you need to, mentally, you need to understand who's kind of who's kind of with you, who's going, to be in it, who's going to be in the trench with you when you can't raise money or when you have a really bad quarter or, or things like that. You just need to, you know, and, and I think if you're really engaged in that way, it makes it easier to have the really hard conversations, which you have to have when you say, look, you just, I know you founded the company, you're awesome, I love you, but you can't stay in your job. Yeah. And you've only earned that right if you've been with them you know, through the really, they know that you've tried to help, right? Yeah. So it's, it's hard, you know, again, if you're, if you're, rain, if you're trained 
if you grew up the way I grew up, you know, the company comes first. And it's always hard with founder-led companies to make that slight separation between the needs of the founder and the needs of the company. And in most times, there are 100% overlap. But sometimes, in, particularly in crisis, there can be daylight. And that's, and that's uh, some of the harder stuff you have to deal with. Yeah. Well, Jeff, it's been amazing. I think the, the takeaways I came away with were not a crisis in a cycle. It's healthy, so founders should be opportunistic about the opportunities. And then also we just be really smart around the, who you have around the table uh, at your board. Have good people, stay first principles. You, you know, being on the West Coast for the last five years, the company I appreciate a lot, uh, Vanessa, is Apple, who at scale, they just have this product headset that, you know, I'm sure it deviates a little bit, but st they stay true to it. And I think leaders that have a good, you know, first principle, right, mm -hmm. are going to do well even in a, a tough, uh, a tough crisis. The last thing I'd say is just before we, I know we have to go, but this could be an awesome ecosystem for venture. Uh, this country needs cities like Atlanta to steal more of the venture headset. You've got great universities. Uh, you've got big company ecosystem. You've got everything it takes. If anything, you got to be bigger. You got to do more faster. But you know, particularly after COVID, people don't want to necessarily hang out in San Francisco, Boston, New York anymore. Uh, Atlanta should rule. Yeah, I agree with that. Great. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Thanks. Jeff.